Joining me today is an activist, an author, a snarky Twitterer, Twitterer, and co-host of the Secular Jihadists podcast, Yasmin Mohammed. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to talk to you. I feel that Twitter has wanted this to happen, so you have to sort of bend if <laughs> yeah. Twitter demands something, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So for people who don't know you, because we've gotten to know each other a little bit in 140 characters over mm -hmm. the last six months or so. Uh, who are you? What are you doing here? Um, so I am a ex-Muslim author and activist. Um, I very recently just wrote a, a book, a memoir of my life uh, called From Al-Qaeda to Atheism. And in it I describe how I was born and raised in Canada. Um, so, you know, a secular free country, but I had a very conservative upbringing. Um, and when we say conservative, when we're talking about Muslims, it's, it's incredibly conservative. So I... Uh, so, so what does that actually mean? So a hijab was put on me at the age of nine. Um, I went to Islamic schools as opposed to uh, public schools as much as my family could. Mm -hmm. um, so like throughout elementary school. And then there was no public school for, or there was no Islamic school for high school, so I ended up going to a, a public school. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to public school for one year, and then I made friends, and I was becoming too westernized. So then my mom took me out of school and just kept me home. Um, but then that's against the law, so then she had to send me back again. So it was, you know, th this constant struggle all the time in my family with me just asking too many questions and uh, loving Canada too much and my Canadian friends, my non-Muslim friends. And, um, you know, I was not the, the good little conservative Muslim <laughs> girl that I was supposed to be. Right. So, um, yeah, so after high school, we went to Egypt to, to just visit family mm -hmm. and uh, woke up one morning and my family were gone. Uh, my mom had just left me there. Wow. And uh, when I spoke to her on the phone, I'm like, what's going on? What happened? Like, why did you leave me here? And she was saying, well, because you're just too much, you're too much to handle. You're too much trouble. So I'll leave you there with your aunts. And how much trouble can you cause in, a, in an Islamic society, right? right? right. So it's, she's, she felt like I was safer there than. How old were you at this time? I was 17. And this, I mean, Dave, you have, like, I never did anything. Like, I never had a boyfriend. I never drank. I never, like, I, I compared to, like, regular Canadian kids, I never did a thing. Like, I was such a good girl. Right. But it... I, I can't even imagine what a regular Canadian kid would do. That would be so bad. <laughs> Canadians are so polite and yeah. pleasant and decent, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it just wasn't good enough. So, um, so literally left you in Egypt and yeah. was like, you know what, let Mubarak deal with it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah pretty much, yeah. And, and what, then what happened? Uh, so I stayed there for two years and uh, she was trying to get me to marry my cousin when I was there. Uh, and I was able to come home again by telling her that I just wanted to come visit Canada for one last time and, and say goodbye, you know. So as far as she knew, everything was fine with the marriage like it, you know i was going to i was going to marry this guy and you know he's buying an apartment and blah, blah blah but once i got on the plane i was like there's like unless you're going to physically pick me up and put me back on a plane to egypt there's no way that i'm ever coming back to this country so i um so i stayed with her and I had nowhere else to go. These are the days before internet and right. Facebook, and I couldn't contact any of my high school friends. I'd lost contact with them for two years. And uh, so it was, a, it was a really bad time because she just, she didn't want me there and I wouldn't leave. <laughs> like she wanted me to go back to Egypt and marry this guy. So it was, it was more contentious, contentious than even all of those other years growing up. And so eventually, she pushed me into this marriage um, and I was so tired of fighting at that point. Mm -hmm. I was like, fine, let's try it your way. Let's see, you know, maybe, maybe this will work. Maybe, maybe you'll actually love me if I listen to you. Like I'll, I just, I just, I decided to succumb. Yeah. 
and I married the guy that she forced me to marry. Um, when you say cousin, is that? Well, this First isn't the cousin. This isn't the cousin. The, yeah, the cousin so is back right. in Egypt. Oh, okay. so now we're oh in I thought suddenly he came there. And, okay, yeah, okay, no, okay. no, this is a new guy in okay. Canada now. Who, ah, this is the Al Qaeda guy. This, we're is, this is him. Get to that yeah, in a second. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I didn't know who he was. He was like cousin 15 years older than me. Cousin Al Qaeda. <laughs> You've had quite a run here. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know he was Al Qaeda. I didn't even know what Al Qaeda was. Yeah. But. Um, all right, so know, let's pause there for a sec. So, yeah. Okay, so you. they find this other guy, and they're like, all right, we're gonna mm -hmm. arrange his marriage. Mm -hmm. You basically kind of throw your hands up and say, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just try, Fine. Yeah. try it your way. Mm. Um, but now we have to explain this Al-Qaeda thing before yeah. we get too far ahead of yeah. ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so I ended up marrying him. What was he doing him. in Canada? You know, he, well, he was, he was in Canada for 9-11. So this is, this is prior to 9-11. So I didn't know who Osama bin Laden was. I didn't know Al who Al-Qaeda were. Like, so what ended up happening was my mom ended up having a nosebleed, but then also coughing up blood simultaneously. And so I called 911, and an ambulance came and picked her up, and I went with her to the hospital. And that was the very first time in the entire marriage that I was actually out of the house with nobody around me. Like, he wasn't with me, my mom wasn't with me. And I was in the waiting room, and I was approached by a man and a woman, and I thought that they were doctors or something. I wasn't really sure what was going on, but then they were telling me they were CSIS, and I was like, what's CSIS? I didn't even realize that that's like the Canadian CIA. And then they told me that the man I was married to was an Al-Qaeda agent, and he's connected to Osama bin Laden, and the, they've been following him, and he came to Canada. I didn't know any of this. He came to Canada with a, a fake Saudi Arabian passport from Afghanistan, and so that's got red flags all over it. Yeah. Um, and then they said, don't tell your mom, don't tell him, like we're gonna try and keep in contact with you. And I was like, how? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right. How is this gonna work? Yeah. Um, but I was, I, I already had a daughter by then, I had a little baby and I wanted, I was so wanted to get her out of that world because I didn't want her to have the same life that I'd had. Um, and when they told me this, it was like, okay, now I really need to, to get out of this yeah. world. Uh, and um, all right, so wait. Let's let's mm -hmm, pause for a second because mm -hmm. you're giving me a lot here. A lot of questions. When you met him mm -hmm. in Canada, so you obviously had no idea about any of the history or the background or anything. Did at any point you suspect that something was odd or fishy, or did it all sort of fit within sort of the, this conservative religious whatever? Yeah. So he was extra conservative, even even more so than my family were really conservative. But like he made me wear the niqab. Like I couldn't even show my eyes. Like it had to be full covering of everything. Yeah. Do you um, think conservative isn't the right word for it's this? It's definitely anymore? not the right now, word. Because just hearing you say it that way, yeah. it feels like it's mm -hmm. too confusing now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the right word is. I mean, people these days use Islamist, but it's not even, Islamist just describes uh, a person who wants to um, politic, like who wants Islam in politics, like is, is eager to get it in like Sharia law right. implemented or something like that. But there are a lot of problematic Muslims that don't necessarily have political aspirations. But like, so, uh, like, somebody who honor kills their child, for example, or who wants, to, like, he wanted to uh, perform FGM on our daughter. He's like, when are we going to get her fixed? And I was like, what, what do you mean fixed? And he's like, you know, cleaned up. When are we gonna when are we gonna purify her? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then my mom said, Oh no, that's when she's older. You have to you can't do that when she's a baby. And then I realized what they were talking about. And so even though my mom is from Egypt where this is like prevalent, mm -hmm. she came from a really secular kind of family and no like kind of high class, like her 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 um her uncle was the first president of Egypt, so they were just like, wow. yeah, so like a- Who's that? Uh, Muhammad, Muhammad Najib, or Najib, yeah. that's how they say it. I should know that. Yeah, well, he, he was only there for like a short time, um, but uh, you know what I mean? Like, so she came from that kind of upbringing where she yeah. had like nannies and cooks and chefs, no, we're not cooks and chefs. Right. But, you know I mean? <laughs> right, but that also, it's partly why maybe the word conservative doesn't work, because they were probably conservative in their own way, but they weren't, 
well, she, Islamists or at least trying to mm -hmm. instill s mm -hmm. some of the crazier parts of religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So she grew up in a super secular home. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. No, There's no, just so much it's to fine. say. Yeah, yeah. She grew up in a in a super like almost European kind of upbringing in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Like she went to Catholic schools just because her parents wanted her to learn French, and the, you know the nuns were that's where the, that's the best French school. Um, and she had Christian friends, and it was like a totally different world than what she raised us in. Yeah. So she had that life, and her and my dad met, and they, you know, they lived in San Francisco and all like that, you know, hippie love piece in the '60s. So yeah. it was, um, and then they, they moved to Canada, and their relationship fell apart. So by then they had three kids, and my mom was all alone with three children, and. So she kind of, you know, she was like under 30 with three children all by herself in a brand new country. And so she was approached by some guy at the mosque because of course that's what you do when you're all by yourself and you have no community. So she went to the mosque to try and find a community there. Um, and this guy who was already married and already had three kids of his own um, offered to marry her as his like concurrent second wife. But the and how is that legal in Canada? It's not, but yeah. they still do it. Lots of them do it. Yeah. Because um, then it, it, I guess, you know, legally he's only married to one. Right. And then the other one is just like. So there's some sort of religious contract, but by yes, by all by their day to day life, in effect, it's a wife. Yep. Yep. And uh, so he, the stipulation was she'd have to start covering her hair, and she'd have to teach her kids how to pray and read Quran and. And he came to our house and he, he took all her records and he was breaking them all because music is forbidden. Um, and it was just like, I remember, like I was about five or six years old at the time, so it was a real shock. <laughs> you know, like here yeah. I am, like I'm allowed to go swimming and, and bike riding and play with my non-Muslim friends and have like a normal life. And then all of a sudden he came in and it was just like, everything changed. So I pushed back from the very beginning because like now birthdays aren't allowed, like I can't eat Oreo cookies anymore, I can't have hot dog day at school, like all these What's things the that What's the matter with matter. Oreos? There's not... lard, in, well there was lard yeah, in them in those <laughs> days. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're halal now probably. They're halal now, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's progress or not, but all right, here, <laughs> yeah. here we are, wow, Oreos. Actually that... I was excited when everything stopped having lard in it because I was like, yay! No. <laughs> Now I get to eat all this food. Yeah. Um, so even at five years old, this is changing in front of you, and you mm -hmm. you instinctively knew something's not right. Well, here. you're taking away all the stuff that kids love, right? Yeah. Like our birthdays was huge because I was so excited about finally getting a birthday because I before that I was too young to really remember. Mm -hmm. But this that year I was like, ooh, I'm gonna plan a fun birthday, and um, and then it was like, nope, birthdays are haram, like everything. Everything was hot on. No more swimming, no more bike riding, no more playing with your friends even. They're girls, but they're non-Muslim, so you can't be friends with them because that's against Islam. I mean, I have to explain that my, my mom it was a student at Al-Azhar University, and she was the head of the Islamic Studies Department in the Islamic school that I attended. Mm -hmm. So she, she knows her stuff religiously, like she would, and she followed it verbatim. So um, whenever she told us what we were not allowed to do, she would always give us a hadith or the, the Quran, like the ayah, the, 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 the verse to back up why she's saying this. Yeah. So, well, let's pause there for one sec. So for people that have no idea, without getting too much into the mm -hmm. religious part, because mm -hmm. I always feel like mm -hmm. for those of us that aren't religious mm -hmm. and we have this conversation, we get lost mm -hmm. in talking about things that mm -hmm. we don't even believe in, which, mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. which is sort of annoying. But can you just explain the difference between the Hadith and the Quran? Mm -hmm. So basically the Quran will, will, will tell you what to do and then the Hadith will tell you how to do it. And so the Hadith are based on how the Prophet Muhammad lived. So how did, how did he do things? And as Muslims, you're supposed to try and follow as closely as possible how he lived because he's a perfect example of a perfect man. Mm -hmm. And so um, we follow, or they follow whatever, however he lived his life, that's how Muslims should try and live theirs as well. Yeah. 
Your eye motions told most of the story. Yeah, because right? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's things like, you know, he married a six-year-old girl. Like, these are things that are happening. Millions of girls across the planet today yeah. are, this is still happening because people want to live in the same way that he lived. We have to follow his example. ISIS are following his example. Um, yeah. So well, some horrible things happen when you follow the example of this man, right? Yeah. So all right. So we can get to some of that stuff, the political mm -hmm. end of it later. But mm -hmm. but a little more on your story here. Mm -hmm. So in your five, you see this happening. Mm -hmm. um, how did you? I mean, a five-year-old going through that, I, I can't mm -hmm. imagine. Yeah, I was very unhappy. Um, and uh, how insular was it? Like once it started, were you, so you basically were cut off, right? You couldn't. Yeah. You couldn't. Where are you going to go at five years old? Where are you going? Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it was just, for me, it was a constant internal struggle because I, I missed my old life and I, and I wanted to be, like in, inside, I wasn't able to be who I was on the outside. Like on the outside, I had a hijab on and people look at me and they're like, Muslim. Meanwhile, on the inside, I was like, no. <laughs> you know, like that's not. Yeah, but I thought the hijab was a, a symbol of empowerment for right. women. Right. Yeah. That's what Linda Sarsour said. Oh God, her name. Yeah, we'll get to her. It means cockroach in yeah, Arabic. It does. Doesn't it? Sarsour which means is cockroach brilliant. in Arabic, people. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Okay, Allah. so let's talk about the the hijab for just a second yeah. because it has yeah. become yeah. Uh, this this very conflated mm -hmm. symbol these days. It's, it's, it's almost the exact example of what intersectionality is mm -hmm. and how ridiculous it is mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the feminists are using the hijab yeah. as a symbol of freedom or something. Mm -hmm. I was, two weeks ago, I was at a street fair in West Hollywood, which is literally the gayest <laughs> place on earth. They have mm -hmm. rainbow crosswalks mm -hmm. and there was Four gay guys, they have a little mannequin company. Then they're, they're mm -hmm. very gay and mm -hmm. over the mm -hmm. top and wonderful. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And they had a mannequin of a woman in a full niqab mm -hmm. in the American flag, you know, because oh. there's that picture. I think there's a picture that went around. Yeah. And I thought, man, you guys are, are so missing the ball yeah. of what's happening here. So mm -hmm. do, let's just talk about the hijab for a second. So as someone that wore it, yeah. when you see it now being fetishized mm -hmm. by those on the left, mm -hmm. w what's happening here? So it's really just ignorance because they are fetishizing it, thinking that they are celebrating people. But really what they're doing is they're celebrating Islam. They're celebrating a religion, which is crazy that it's coming from liberal people who are atheists and, and they're celebrating a religion. Like to me, it's the same as celebrating Mormon underwear right. or, or something, you know, right. or like or an Amish bonnet or apron or whatever yeah. like you're you're celebrating a far-right conservative Islamic thing like most American women don't even wear a hijab mm -hmm. but they're they're not even just celebrating the religion but they're celebrating the far-right aspect of the religion and it to you is that the soft bigotry of low expectations that somehow that that's the only way they can view you. The only way they can somehow empower you is to view you as a subject, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. a little pet sort of. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. So they want to, they want to, you know, honor minorities or, or celebrate differences or whatever. Fine, do that. Celebrate humans. Don't celebrate their religion. Yeah. I mean, they think of Muslims as, like, you know, if you, if, if I said, for example, you know, I know a Catholic person from the Philippines, and I know a Catholic person from Italy, and I know a Catholic person from Mexico. You would never think that all three of these people <laughs> share a culture. You right. know, like they share a religion. Yeah. They don't share a culture. If I want to celebrate these people, then I'll celebrate Mexican heritage and Italian heritage and Filipino heritage and culture. I'm not going to celebrate Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what they're doing when they're when they're celebrating the hijab. When it, you know, when. Um, when Hillary Clinton was tweeting about the the woman that was in the Olympics, just because she had a hijab on, like yeah. you're you're, and then then again you've got the symbol of the of the women's march, which was so incredibly confusing. Yeah. Like you, it's a liberal march, and then your symbol is a far right conservative Muslim. Like I think they don't understand that just like there's a spectrum in the United States between left and right. 
that same spectrum exists, you know, in, in, in the Muslim world as well. Yeah. So you've got your left, you know, liberal Majid Nawaz, for example, mm -hmm. on, on one side of the spectrum. And then you've got on the other side of the spectrum, somebody who supports Sharia law, Linda Cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Linda Sarsour, and, and they're celebrating her. Right. Meanwhile, Majid goes on the list of SPLC for being an anti-Muslim bigot. Yeah. So liberals are not supporting quite literally. liberals. We, we've talked about it on yeah. the show before, but quite literally, yeah. he is on the Southern mm -hmm. Poverty Law, Law Center's list of anti-Muslim mm -hmm. bigots or whatever, mm -hmm. and Ayan Hirsi Ali is also mm -hmm. on there. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. this is the height of hypocrisy yeah. and, and ridiculous. Yeah. So instead of liberals supporting other liberals, liberals are supporting conservatives. And, and just because she happens to have brown skin, so therefore we need to just celebrate everything that she does. She supports Sharia law, but, it's, but that's okay because, you know. Right, I mean, I'm sure you saw it. I, I think we went back and forth a little bit on Twitter when this happened, but she has all these old tweets defending Sharia law. And then there's, there's just, it might be the most vile thing I've ever read on Twitter, yeah. where she talks about, basically in effect says that Ayan Hirsi Ali and uh, Bridget Gabriel, who I have coming on the show in a couple weeks, that they don't deserve to have their vaginas, knowing full well that Ayan underwent FGM. Mm -hmm. And this woman is, is the leader of the Women's March, yeah. and Bernie is literally tweeting, yes. hashtag, I stand with Linda. So what, what do we do about this? Because this has been the theme. When, I, when mm -hmm. I've talked to you and I've mm -hmm. talked to Sarah mm -hmm. and Ali and Faisal and, and all of these people who mm -hmm. I only judge you individually by mm -hmm. what you're telling me right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. How do we unfurl some of this nonsense? Well, I think it's, it all comes down to identity politics. And identity politics is basically just a nice way of saying, you know, racism or bigotry, really. It's just a nuanced bigotry. So people on the left can see that, that you know, alt-writers are just all about, you know, skin color. And they're like, oh, we're not going to do that. We're going to do the opposite. We're mm -hmm. going to also be all about skin color. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's so opposite. It's the same. It's so opposite. It's the same. I mean, I think both ends of the spectrum, I don't know which one is crazier than the other, to mm -hmm. be honest. Like, the far right people think that I'm a closet Islamist, and the far left people think that I'm a closet bigot, you know, mm -hmm. uh, alt-writer, actually. So they're both delusional, obviously. And you know what? They don't matter. Because I think that those two groups are really small minorities and I think that most of us are sane rational people in the middle and I think that if you could just explain to people like if they just spent a little bit of time understanding that this is a religious symbol and you're supporting a religion right now and a religion by the way which would subjugate you right 100% yeah I'm like, a kafar you're a mm -hmm. you're an apostate we would both this be is killed. not Great for us. No, no. I mean, anybody non-Muslim would be killed. Yeah. So, you know, that, like, look what's happening, what just happened in Egypt. Egypt yeah. is 90% Muslim. 10%, um, you know, of non-Muslim still isn't good enough. Yeah. Right? We're still going to kill them while they're, while they're in prayer. So it, it's not like anybody is going to be left off the hook. You know, it doesn't, it's not just if you're an apostate or if you're gay or it's anybody that is non-Muslim, yeah. you're all I, up for grabs. I mean, it's a whole other discussion, but Egypt is such a sad example too. I was in Egypt 20 years ago in 1997. I had a great time there for a week. And I went, I, had been, I was in Israel before and I went there with Israeli passport, uh, mm -hmm. stamps on my passport, went to Egypt, went through Sinai, mm -hmm. was there for a week, but you'd have to be crazy to do that these days mm -hmm. because of the way extremism has, yeah. has gone. Yeah. And if there, there's a video online of Gamal Abdel Nasser, who it, it was about in the 1950s, where he was talking about the Muslim Brotherhood came to him, and they were telling him, "We want you to put a hijab on all the women," mm -hmm. and he was laughing at them, yeah. and people in the audience were laughing, and they're like, "Tell him to wear it," and, and all. Oh, this I've seen the stuff. video. It's like in yeah. front of a whole group of people, yes, right? Yeah, 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 in Parliament. Yeah. And what's that happened in the in the 50s, and people thought it was a joke. So people are like, of course we're not going to become conservative here, yeah. you know. Um, but if, but look at look at Egypt today, right? And that that's sort of a, what I see happening in the rest of the world. So in in Europe, they kind of have that same attitude of like, oh, that's not going to happen to us. Meanwhile, there's over 80 courts with Sharia law. Mm -hmm. There's areas of France that are gender segregated. You know, like this this idea of like, oh, that's never going to happen to us is something that a lot of people have said before and they've all been proven wrong. So I think that we need to be 
more vigilant, more aware, more in the same way that we're very careful to keep Christianity out, mm -hmm. we should be just as careful with keeping Islam out. Right, and that's why I talk about this so much because it's like everyone will go nuts on the left, they'll go nuts over the one baker who won't bake the cake, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yet at the same time they'll then fetishize the hijab mm -hmm. or anything else.